Well, as the ushers begin to make their way back, if you take your Bibles and take it, go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Last week, <laughs> we covered quite a bit. We covered the entire chapter 7. That was a lot, and there was so much going on there. But this week, we're only going to cover a few verses, and so we're not going to be reading as much, and it might even be a shorter message. It's not as deep theologically as our last one was, but I want us to cover this because it's a pointed message. It's a challenging message that really convicted me, and I was kind of like, I don't really want to preach this because it convicted me so much. It was like, ouch, I need to be better at this, and I want us to look at it and maybe God will challenge us all together and see us move forward for his cause. But we're going to look at verse number 1 of chapter 8, Acts 8, verse 1, and it says this, And Saul was consenting unto his death. We talked about him last week, Stephen, unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And look at this. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad, look at this, went everywhere preaching the word. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I am so grateful for you. We're grateful for how you take care of us. We're grateful for the great sacrifice that you made so that we could be made free from sin and death. God, I do ask that you would challenge us this morning, that you would change us, transform us to be more like you and more like your son. And I do ask if there's someone here today who's not been made free from sin, who's not been made free from death, who's never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and been saved from their sin, that today would be the day. And I ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, friends, as I was reading this, this challenged me, and it, it was really convicting because I saw in this text something that has crept into sometimes my own life and into the life of so many Christians, and it's this word, complacency. Complacency. Friends, complacency is dangerous. It is incredibly dangerous. And honestly, I'm shocked at how complacent Christians, especially in America, have become. And I have to point the finger at myself. Sometimes I also become complacent. You see, we become content with just a few people saved. And we become content with just a few people added to the kingdom. And just a few minutes with Christ a week. And just a few verses a day. And just a few dollars a month. And just a few prayers offered and if we're not careful we'll see those fires that once were white hot and once burned like a wildfire begin to die down because of complacency and as I was thinking I was like man God what will it take that's what I entitled the sermon what will it take to see those fires rekindled what will it take to make us white hot again? To where we, when we come to sing, we're not just singing through the motions, which I'm thankful. I don't think that's what's going on here. But we come and our fires are stoked and we sing these songs with that white hot passion. And maybe even tears come to our eyes as we remember, man, the love of Christ passes all my knowledge. It's so wonderful. It's so great. What will it take to get us white hot again? What will it take to get us to share our faith? daily to go out and share what Jesus has done for us with those that we come in contact with what will it take for us to cherish our time with each other as a local church and we want to be with each other and we're excited to see somebody else here and we're excited to build each other up and to repair each other's walls what will it take for us to fall in love madly in love with this book to where when it's time for the morning devotions it's not like I gotta do this I know I'll squeeze in a couple verses here and there but it's like man I get to come to the Word of God. I get to read what He has for us. I get to spend time with the Creator. What will it take for us to become white hot again? What will it take? You know, God's not done working. 
He is not done working at all. He can still do great and marvelous things. But my question is this. What does God have to do to get me to join him in his work? What does God have to do to get you to join him in his work? As I was studying this, I thought, man, if we let complacency win, what kind of future are we going to leave for our kids? If we become content with how things are in our own lives, what kind of future am I going to leave little Addison, little Hudson, little Trayson, and now big chunky Dawson, right? <laughs> What kind of future are we going to leave them if we are just, okay, we don't really need to go all out for Jesus. We don't really need to go all out for Christ. We can just settle in. Things are okay. Maybe you're here and you're wondering, what do you mean by complacency? Well, one man put it this way. Complacency is a blight that saps energy dulls attitudes and causes a drain on the brain. He says the first symptom is satisfaction with things as they are. The second is rejection of things as they might be. To put that in our context, it's like, man, you know, God's done great things at Grants Pass Baptist. Look at this. This is awesome. I mean, a year ago, we didn't even exist. And look, we've got people in a, in a unity that's, that's brewing. I mean, this is amazing. This is awesome. And this is as good as it's going to get. We are okay just here. Let's just stay right here, us few and no more. We'll just hunker down until the rapture, right? This is great. And we lose sight of what could be. And we say, no, God could never do that. And God could never really change Grant's past. And God really couldn't save a bunch of people. And this is about as, bo- as good as it can get. That is complacency. When we are okay with where we are and we don't even care about what can be, complacency has begun to set in. He goes on to say this, good enough Good enough becomes the watchword and tomorrow's standard. He says complacency makes people fear the unknown. It makes people mistrust the untried and abhor the new. He says like water, complacent people follow the easiest course downhill. Friend, complacency is dangerous. It is incredibly dangerous. And in this passage that we're going to discuss this morning, we're going to see how God rids his people of complacency. And I want to ask us this morning, what will it take for us to be all in? Like all in. And I know a lot of you, you are committed. But I just want to think, what would it take for us to be white hot, on fire? What will it take to get us there? And I don't mean to offend anybody this morning. I hope you're not sitting there like, how dare he insinuate I'm not white hot. That's not my goal. My goal is not to make you leave if you're angry at me. My goal is this, to stir us up, to exhort us, not to settle in, but to continue to press forward. Are you content with the Christian life you're living right now? Are you content with it? Like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm just like Jesus right now. (laughs) I'm perfect. No need to go further. Are you content with it? Are you content with where you are in your Christian life? Or do you want more? Do you want to go further? Do you want to see God use you like he used Paul, like he used Stephen, like he used Philip? I'm telling you, sign me up. I'm not content with where I am. I want to press forward. And my question is this. Do you? Do you? Do you want to press forward? forward? If so, I want us to learn from the early church, and I want us to learn from their mistakes. As a third child, I know we have four kids in my family when I was younger, and they're still all alive. They're not gone, okay, so they're still all here, but we had my oldest sister, Chantel, my middle sister, I guess the second oldest, Bethany, me, and then my younger brother, Jonah, and do you know what I learned to do as a, as a third child? I learned to learn from these two's mistakes, right? That was the smartest thing you could do is when they get in trouble, we're like, I ain't going that way, I ain't taking that path. And this is what I want us to do this morning. I want us to look at our older siblings in the Bible, and I want us to learn from them so that we don't have to go through what they had to go through. Let's learn from what God did with them so that it won't take as much to get us to do what he wants us to do. And we're going to look at this three stages 
past complacency. Three stages on the road past complacency. And the first stage on the road past complacency is this. A clear command. A clear command. You see, friends, in Acts 1.8, you don't need to turn there, you can. It's not very far away. In Acts 1.8, do you know what Jesus tells them? Jesus tells them this, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem. And that's about as far as we've gotten so far. But guess what else he said? Both and in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, to the uttermost part of the world. He says, not only are you supposed to witness here in Jerusalem, you've got to go everywhere preaching the word. But it wasn't just a blueprint. He commanded them in Matthew 28, the last few verses, the last three verses of Matthew 28. Do you know what he tells them? He tells them this, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go! Do you know what the word go? It's not just a suggestion. It's in the imperative mood. That means this is a command. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Friends, believers' job wasn't very complex. They had a mission. They had a job. And it wasn't complicated. It wasn't obscure. Jesus said, go. He said, you're supposed to get out there. Don't keep this to yourselves. He said, share the good news with everyone. Tell them what I have taught you. Make disciples as I have discipled you. And don't just do it in Jerusalem. Do it everywhere. Friends, this wasn't a suggestion, this was a command, and this command was supposed to become the disciples' life mission. Like Peter, you're no longer fishing. Your life mission is to make disciples. Your life mission is to share the good news. It was supposed to become the reason why they lived. And can I be honest with you, friends? That command is supposed to be our life mission as well. Like, like, okay, you guys are going to hate me. When you leave out of here, I know I'm going to get hate mail tonight. I know. Okay, but here's the thing. Ready? This one command is more important than our jobs. Are you saying jobs aren't important? No, no. Please, keep your job. Keep going, okay? But I'll tell you what's more important than your work. This one command. To go ye therefore and teach all nations. This is why we live. This one command is more important than our hobbies and our pastimes. This one command is the very reason God left us behind when we got saved. He could have taken us right to heaven, but he left you here to be a witness for him. Friend, this one command is huge. Can I ask you, how have you been doing? How have I been doing? A wise man once said, it's easy to determine when something is aflame. He said, if something is aflame, it ignites other material. Any fire that does not spread will eventually die and go out. He goes on to say, a church without evangelism is a contradiction in terms, just as a fire that does not burn is a contradiction. Friends, if we raise our hands and say, I'm on fire, who else is catching fire because of you? Who else is beginning to know about Jesus because of you? Who else is beginning to love the Savior because of you? Who else is catching flame? Who this week, this is what convicted me, who this week has heard the good news from your lips? And I'm not, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this. I'm getting pointed. I'm not just saying, well, they know I'm a Christian. <laughs> I mean, they, they, are very, they very well know that as I walk around, I am a Christian. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm glad you're living like a Christian. I really am. But here's the question. 
Who this week have you brought closer to Jesus because of your counsel, because of your discipleship? Who are you telling about Jesus? Who's a follower of Jesus now because of your obedience to this one vital command? Friend, the command is clear. He said, go, go out there and tell everybody about me. Go out there and disciple others. Go baptize, disciple, starting in Jerusalem and then move out from there everywhere. Can I ask you, how are you doing this morning? How am I doing this morning? And then this question, what will it take for us to take that command seriously? You know, if I'm sitting in the seat, you know what I can easily do? I'm pretty good at this. I'm okay. I think, I think where we are is just fine. I don't think we need to change our life very much. I think I'm doing a good job and we become complacent. But friend, can I just ask you, are we really doing what Jesus had commanded us to do? You see, we see a clear command. Go and tell everyone. But the second stage on the road past complacency is this. A comfortable Church, a comfortable church. You see, we have journeyed through the book of Acts, and it's been so fun. I have enjoyed it. Starting in chapter 1, now we're in chapter 8. And as we've taken this journey together, we have seen some amazing things, some incredible highs and some incredible power that God showed. And the church, they began with powerful obedience, right? I mean, they got there. They're out there sharing the gospel. And thousands and thousands of people are saying, I believe in Jesus. I'm not going to rest in my works. I'm not going to rest in my religion. I'm going to trust Jesus and Jesus alone and thousands are added to the church at one time and another time thousands are added to the church and we're seeing some amazing things happen as they are going forward and yes they endured some rebuke and they endured some hurt but as we see this they're not really that persecuted yet and this is what makes me so sad you see they had seen thousands saved But then it seems like they forgot the rest of Jesus' command. They forgot that it wasn't just to make disciples in Jerusalem. What did it say? It says, beginning in Jerusalem, and then what? In all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. They were supposed to keep going, but do you know what we don't see? They don't keep going. They stop They grow comfortable in Jerusalem. A man once said this, In the Great Commission, the Lord has called us to be like Peter, fishers of men. But we turn the command around and instead become keepers of the aquarium. We have an aquarium and we tend to the fish in the aquarium. And sometimes I'll take fish out of your fish bowl and put them in mine. And then sometimes you'll take fish out of my fish bowl and put it in yours, but we're all tending the same fish. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, we're not out there fishing. We're not getting new fish. We're just tending the ones who are already saved. We're just keeping the ones who are already in the family. And sometimes I'll take some from your assembly and put them in mine. And sometimes you'll take some from my assembly and put it in yours. But we're not out there getting new people who've never heard the good news. We're not doing what God has told us to do. We're growing comfortable. We're growing comfortable. You see, God had done mighty works in the early church. We have seen it. But now they're focused more on maintaining what they have there in Jerusalem. And maybe you're thinking, why do you say that, Pastor Addison? Because they hadn't reached past their borders yet. They hadn't gotten out of Jerusalem yet. They were staying in their comfort zone, as you might say. And friend, not much good can be done by someone who stays in their comfort zone. You see, the world won't be impacted by a church that stays in its comfort zone. A family won't be impacted by a person who stays in their comfort zone. And maybe you're thinking this, 
But Pastor Addison, I've done it this way for years. I, I, I mean, I know this way, and, I, and I, I, this is my routine. And if I do what God's asking, I'm going to have to give some things up, maybe some of my pastimes, and I'll have to cut some things out to make time for witnessing that I really enjoy. And if I, if I do what God's asking, people are going to look at me funny. They're going to think that I'm crazy for sharing Jesus with them. And, and, and they might even think I'm a Christian. You know, They might actually think I believe in Jesus. And, and they might actually label me as some kind of fanatic who, who wants to share Jesus with everybody. And can I tell you, Pastor Addison, that makes me very uncomfortable. Can I be honest with you? Can I, can I raise my hand and say it makes me uncomfortable as well? I don't know if there's ever been a time when I've been sharing Jesus outside of these four walls when I'm not nervous, when I'm not a little bit uncomfortable saying, hey, here's some good news. Hey, here's some things that changed my life. I don't know if there's ever been a time when I'm actually like, oh, this is easy. Let's take this track. No, there's never been a time. It's always uncomfortable. But here's the thing. We've got to get outside of our comfort zone if we're going to do what Jesus asked us to do. Maybe you're here and you think, Pastor Addison, hold on a second. I really don't think God wants me to be uncomfortable. In fact, I think that God only wants me to be warm, comfy, snug as a bug in a rug. I think that the most important thing to God is my happiness. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, no. oh all right. Here's, I got to be honest with you. You have been lied to because that's not God's biggest goal for you right now. Can I be honest? There is coming a time when you are going to know happiness forevermore. Oh, yes. And the Bible says at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. There's coming a day when no heartache will be there, where no tears will be there, where you will live forever and ever happy and content and joy-filled. But I'm going to tell you this. In this life, the Bible tells us you will have tribulation. It's going to happen if you are a believer in Jesus. There's going to be hard times, and there's going to be times of sorrow, not as other men sorrow, but we're going to have sorrow, and we're going to have sadness, and we're going to have pain. And if you think about it, our whole goal, is to be like who? Like Jesus. And if I look at Jesus' life, can I be honest with you? It wasn't a bed of roses. In fact, Jesus had to do some things that were very uncomfortable. Do you guys remember the Garden of Gethsemane? I don't think that was comfortable for him. I'll be honest, I've never been so stressed out that I began to sweat blood. And as he looked there, he said, Lord, not that cup. I don't want to do that cup. That was the cup of your wrath, the cup of sin. I don't want it. If it's possible, let it pass from me, but not my will, yours. He had to be a little bit uncomfortable. And here's the beautiful thing. Do you know why Jesus stepped outside his comfort zone? The Bible says in Hebrews, for the joy that was set before him. It says this, think about Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. This is what it teaches us. Greater joy is on the other side of your pain. Greater joy is on the other side of your comfort zone. If you step outside your comfort zone, yes, it might be uncomfortable. And yes, it might even hurt for a second. But this is what Jesus teaches us. There's greater joy on the other side. You say, what kind of joy could come from me stepping outside of my comfort zone? Think about the joy of your friend trusting Jesus as their Savior. Because you chose I'm going to step outside my comfort zone, and I'm going to share Jesus with them. Think about the joy of a neighbor of yours sitting in here, growing, knowing Jesus, their marriage being put back together, their kids learning what it means to be a human, all of them knowing this because you chose to be a little uncomfortable and step outside your comfort zone for a second and talk to them about Jesus. Think also about this joy, the joy of coming into heaven one day. And Jesus looking at you and saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. I will go through some uncomfortableness, even some pain, for the joy that's set before me, like my Savior. But so often, we grow comfortable. And we stick into our little comfort zone. But friend, we're not going to see God do amazing things if we stay in our comfort zone. Will you stay in your comfort zone? You see, we saw the first thing, a clear command. The second part, a comfortable church. But God didn't let them stay as a comfortable church for very long. 
He did not allow complacency to set in. And we're going to see how he does that in our third stage. The third stage is this, a compelled change. A compelled change. You see, the truth is, as we come to Acts 8, we don't know if they eventually on their own would have started sharing the gospel outside of Jerusalem. We can assume so. I mean, we can assume that maybe down the road they would have thought about Judea. And, oh, yeah, remember how Jesus told us to go into Samaria and, and also to the othermost part of the world? We can assume that at some point in time, who knows how long, they would have eventually reached out. But at, up until this time, they haven't. They are still staying in their comfort zone. They're not reaching outside Jerusalem. And so what God does is he allows something uncomfortable to come in and stir up the nest. If you've heard about eagles, I've heard this, you don't quote me on this, that when they, it's time for the young eaglets to leave the nest, they'll begin to put sharper things in there and harder things so that they realize it's time to go. And, and if, if you're a parent, we can do this. <laughs> okay. But my, my dad, he has a story. When his dad started, he made it really sharp. He actually dropped my dad off right after college in the middle of Atlanta with like 50 bucks and said, good luck, and left. That's a very sharp way to make somebody leave the nest, right? But this is what God does. He begins to make it a little bit more uncomfortable for them to stay where they are. And how does he do this? Persecution. God allows persecution to come to the church. You see, up until this point, there had been relative peace. Yes, there had been some minor persecution, especially towards the leadership, but nobody had died until Stephen. And after that, everything changed. Now there was a whole group of people who was seeking to destroy Christians and their families. And this group was headed by a person named Saul. Let's read the first three verses again. It says this, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Remember last, last week we read that they threw their coats at a young man named Saul. And this same Saul who had their, their coats at his feet was consenting, saying, yeah, hit him again. Throw that rock harder. He needs to die. He was consenting unto his death. And at that time was a, look at those two words, great persecution. It wasn't an average. It was great against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And look at verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling. That word means dragging. He literally would drag people out of their homes, men and women, and committed them to prison. Friend, Saul made havoc of the church. This word for havoc, is, it's only used here in the New Testament. And so they had to look outside the New Testament to really understand its meaning. And this word for havoc is used of wild boar and how they lacerate and tear things apart. That's what they're trying to get you in your mind to think. That Paul, when he was coming to these families and to the church, he was wanting to obliterate it. He was wanting to destroy it. He was wanting to stamp it out of existence. And you would think that this would be the end of the church. I mean, seriously, it's a baby church. It's only been around for a little bit of time, and it hasn't even moved outside of Jerusalem yet. It's in one city. You would think that all of this harsh persecution, that people losing their jobs and people having death threats and people being ripped away from, from their homes and their friends turning against them, you would think that that would cause people to stop believing in Jesus. But that's not the case in fact, friends, that's like never the case. More people leave Jesus when they're comfortable than when they're in pain. You see, what often happens, we'll have some people come in and their, their life is hard. But then you know what happens? God begins to bless them. He begins to grow them. And do you know what they say? Sayonara to Jesus. I'm thankful he helped me. But now I'm comfy. I don't really need God anymore. I mean, I've got a house and I've got a nice job. Sayonara, God. Thank you for getting me on my feet. But I don't really need you anymore. So when we are in comfort, it's easier to say, I don't need God. I don't need him. I don't need the church. I'm okay by myself. But the truth is, when persecution begins to ramp up, Christians begin to wake up, and they begin to stand up, and they begin to say, no, 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 I'm going to hold on to Jesus, and I'm going to hold on to God, and I'm going to hold on to what he's done. Because, friends, persecution never hurts the church. I want to say that one more time. Persecution never 
hurts the church. You see in verse 4 what happens? It says this, Therefore they that were scattered abroad, what did they do? They went everywhere preaching the word. God allowed this persecution to come in because what he knew needed to happen wasn't happening. And so persecution comes in, and this persecution didn't hurt the church. All it did was spread the gospel to places that they were uncomfortable going. It began to spread like a wildfire. I remember I was in high school, and I had a Bible class, and the teacher got up, and he was reading a book on Chinese Christians. And I don't know if this was a true book or if it was fiction, but as he was reading it, it was about an American who was in a, a Chinese church, an underground church, and as he was there, he couldn't really understand everything that was going on. But a glass fell over and broke on the ground. And seeing the glass that was broken on the ground, the pastor of this church wasn't taken aback. But instead, do you know what this Chinese pastor began to do? He began to stomp on it. And he began to jump on it. And the more he began to stomp on it, the more the people began to amen and hallelujah, began to praise God. And the more they praised God, the more he stomped. And the more he stomped, the more they praised God. And those Americans like, what in the world is going on? They've lost their minds. What's going on? I don't, I don't remember this happening in America. And so after the service, he comes over to his Chinese friend and he says, hey, what in the world was that all about? Why were they going crazy when he was stomping on the glass? And the Chinese friend looked at him and he said, well, he was showing what persecution does to the church. You see, persecution can't destroy the church. All it does is spread it out and ingrain it all over the land. And it might get smaller and get smaller and spread out and spread out, but persecution can never destroy the church. Amen. And I'm thinking, man, in America, we're so concerned about our, our 401K and our freedom and I heard that Chinese Christians are praying, not that we keep our freedom. Do you know what Chinese Christians are praying for America? Lord, send them persecution. Because before the fall of China and the Cultural Revolution, they said there was like 800,000 Christians. But after, they said there was like 50 million Christians. Because persecution never hurts the church. It actually spreads the church right. like wildfire. And so friends... As I read this, you know what I had to think to myself? What will it take for us to take the command to share the gospel seriously? Will it take God bringing intense persecution for us to begin to share our faith? What will we have to lose before we wake up? What will we have to suffer before we get serious? God has called us to make disciples. And as long as there's people in Grant's past who don't know him, our mission is not complete. Can I ask you, just practically, what would it take for you to give one of these out to somebody at a drive through a cashier? You see, in this little pamphlet, you don't have to say anything. It's all the gospel. Somebody could get saved just by reading this. And all you've got to do is this. Hey, do you mind if I give you some good news? The news in here changed my life. And they could say no. They could say, okay, put it right here. But what would it take? You say, well, that's uncomfortable for me. I second that motion. But friends, we have been called to give the good news, not just to the people in this room, <laughs> but to every living person creature. You see, the person at the drive-thru, Jesus died for them. The people we walk by in Walmart and Fred Meyer, Jesus died for them. But what's it going to take for us to get out of our comfort zone? This was my prayer. Lord, I pray it doesn't take persecution to wake us up. I pray you don't have to rip away our families. I pray you don't have to shut down churches for us to finally get serious about what you've asked us to do. I pray that we just willingly say, Lord, you said go to every creature. I know it's uncomfortable, but I'll go. Lord, you don't have to work hard on me. I willingly obey.
And do you know what would happen? We would see God use us in a way we'd never seen him use us before. As witnesses, as disciple makers. And one day we'll hear God say, well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Everyone's head bowed, everyone's eyes closed, and we're looking around.